It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. Thanks to Kong Kamin for bringing me. It's a great pleasure. To the governor, the organizer, the president of the organization. Great pleasure. So I'm here to speak to you tonight about El Futuro, the future. And it's interesting, you know, I, I live in Switzerland, in Zurich. I've been to Mexico many times, maybe 12, 13 times. And every time I come, it changes a lot. I'm glad I get to go to Leon this time and not always to Mexico City. So it's a great pleasure to be with you tonight. So when we speak about the future, many people today are worried about the future. And for good reason. The pandemic, the war in Europe, inflation, automation, technology, storms, climate change. If you speak today to kids, you know, young adults from, say, 25 to 35, many people of that age will tell you that they are worried about the future. My own son, he's 33, when I talk to him about what I call the good future, el buen futuro, el buen futuro, then he says, the future is not going to be good. Have you been asleep? So I'm here to tell you today that the future is better than we think. Right? The future is something that we really have to understand and it kind of picture it like this, uh, a road that's moving very quickly. And many of us keep looking in the mirror of the past. You know, what has worked in the past, we do again, we do it better. You know, I'm from Germany originally, and in Germany we love perfection, right? I know many German people are coming to Lyon, right? We love engineering, perfection. But the future is not like this. And when I talk about the future, I'm not talking about predicting the future, like telling you what is going to happen. I would like you to be better prepared for the future. This is very important because the future isn't about tomorrow. You know, it's not science fiction. The future is here. The other day, I went to Palo Alto, California. I took a ride in a car, self-driving car from Waymo. Where there was no driver in the front. And, well, it works there. Probably wouldn't work here, right? But we have to be prepared. And this is what I like to do, right? I call this the future mindset, right? listening. You would be surprised how many government officials and people who run large companies don't use their ears to observe. And this is what we have to do now, because we can see the future happening all around us. I mean, it's mind-boggling what's going to happen. Take the car industry, good German traditional industry. Okay? Ten years ago, I had a big event at one of the big German car companies, maybe nine years ago, and we talk about electric cars, self-driving cars, car sharing, right? and everybody in the room was laughing. Right? Nobody thinks electric cars were any good. Right? They were, electric cars don't work. Now we have this. Right? You see this chart here? This here is the combustion engine. Right? That is the engine that is in pretty much every car. Get my clicker to work here. Yeah, please do come back. It's not happening. The black box is the traditional engine, the combustion engine. The red box is software. And basically, the economist says that in the near future, most of the car sales will not be with a traditional engine. They will be software-based. Right? And take this. If you look at a traditional car, there's a thousand pieces in the engine that companies make. Right? The electric engine has 40 pieces. The rest is software. Right? Think about the change in the industry that comes as... If you're not prepared for this, I guarantee you by 2030, nobody in Mexico will buy a car with a gas engine. We will still have cars with a gas engine. People buying electric cars, and they will be so much cheaper. I mean, I love my traditional car, right? But I'm 61. You know? If you're 25 today, the future is this, right? It's not on the left, it's called gasoline thinking, you know, it's electric. So, once destination, our future, is never a place, it's a new way of seeing things. 
And that is so important, especially when you have kids or you run large companies because of responsibility. Right? We have to start to seeing things in a different way. So, electric cars, cars that drive themselves. This is the Waymo. I didn't have a video of myself, but you can clearly see that people are doing this. It's a trial. It's not real like everywhere, but you know, quite scary, right? And of course, Last year, I spoke at the International Car Exhibit in Munich, the IAA, and everything in the exhibit was not about cars. It was about mobility, scooters, sharing, rental agreements, leasing, all kinds of new ways of doing things in the car industry. The future of the car is not to have a car. Think about that for a second. Well, some of us will still have cars, of course, right? But the future is like this for the car industry. Like today, you may remember 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, to listen to music, you buy a CD or a tape, right? Here. I used to be a musician. And what do you do now to get music, right? Play Pink Floyd, right? There's the music. This machine here is our brain, is our dating, is our bank, is our movie machine, is our office. Right? Let me think about this for a second. And this happened in 10 years. What will the world look like in 10 years? Well, it depends how we make it, right? But we have very good cards for a good future because we're inventing all the time powerful science and technology to solve problems. But we do need the right policy, right? The right application of the science and technology. You're going to see cars like this? Well, they can't just be for the rich, right? I mean, if we're going to have a future like this, it has to be a future that's affordable to everybody. One thing is for sure, the future is not gradual. It's jumping. The future is not one, two, three, four, five. But you may know about Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, Wright's law, the laws of physics, right? It's basically exponential. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, right? We're leaping. Seven years from now, we're going to be here, right? 256. That's 80 times as much as today. If we have 20 years, 1 million times as different. That's our kids, right? Our kids are going to live in a world it's a million times as different as today if it keeps on leaping, which it does, right? So, the future is kind of like this from Star Trek, right? It's warp drive. It's exponential and it's gradually then suddenly. Don't think for a minute that you can wait and see what happens and observe. Then you're going to end up like Audi and Mercedes and BMW who are now basically answering to the call of Tesla and Toyota. They're going to make it work, I'm sure. They have good skills for that, but it's a steep price. We have to think about what is coming next, no matter whether you're on education or business or industry. So, 30 steps, I take linear here, I get to over there. 30 steps exponential, I get 26 times around the world. That's the difference. We're going into leap age. And Mexico, of course, has great cards for that future, but we have to get with the program of leaping. Right? And this is, of course, a challenge is to leave things behind, to move into the future, to the next level. So this is our city of the future. Right? Connected, smart, sustainable, green, right? with all of what you call the game changes. I'm going to talk about the game changes a bit more here. But these two things are exponential change, and this is the most important for you in the industry, convergent industries. That means industries that used to be separate coming together. Healthcare and technology, manufacturing and technology, the car industry and technology. Everything is converging. The best business ideas will be converging, coming together, creating new industries. Amazon just bought a piece of a healthcare company. Amazon, which sells books and you know, everything you would ever want, you can buy on Amazon. Amazon will sell you health insurance. 
and then Amazon will sell you a device that is your mobile doctor. I mean, this is obvious, right? So part of your Prime subscription will be the doctor that you can ask questions. And Apple is planning the same. So in this world, there's 11 game changes. I'll only talk about some of them. The game changes are basically, the first one is this, big data, cloud, and the Internet of Things, connected devices. So in manufacturing, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this, the digital twin, connected devices, smart systems, right? making things more efficient, higher margin, more sustainable, less pollution. Did you know that if we make all our industry efficient and our cities, we can save 65% of CO2? Right? Now, if we were to switch the energy to sustainable energy, we could solve the problem. It's not just using solar energy, but also preventing uh, pollution. The other one is intelligent systems. You know, 20 years ago, we used to joke how stupid computers are, right? How utterly stupid. And today, computers are getting smart, right? It's called deep learning, machine learning. Not like us, you know, they're not smart like us. So the other day, a Swiss couple went to Rio de Janeiro, and they arrived there, they rented a car, and they asked Google Maps to take them to the hotel. And Google Maps didn't know what time it was there. They sent them straight to the favela. And they were robbed and almost killed. Right? Because they trust Google Maps. Google Maps took the shortest way, straight to the favela. Right? Not very intelligent uh, in a human sense. Right? So machines are getting smart, but they're not like us. Like, you know, sometimes when you meet people, even only for 40 seconds, you, can, you know who the other person is, right? You have, somehow you figure out what it is. Very hard for computers. 3D printing. Now, oh, we talked about this for 50 years. Right? Now you can 3D print your kneecap. You can have your dental implant printed at the dentist. You can have airplane parts printed. Very soon, you go to a store of Nike or Adidas, and you have your shoe printed. And I'll show you later, you want to print houses. Mexico is perfect for this because you have big spaces. Right? Virtual reality. You remember that scene in Minority Report, the movie with Tom Cruise, right? He goes inside the data, he pulls out the data like this, right? This is going to be reality for people like doctors, lawyers, judges, looking at complex things. The last one is the biggest one for you. Biomanufacturing and nanotechnology. We are developing materials from the natural world that we can copy and use in production. Like spider silk. You heard about spider silk, which is from the spider, and now we make it in an artificial process. It's more flexible than titanium, right? and basically it's a super material. Think about what happens when that comes into factories. Right? Mind-boggling future. So here's the, the shoe with the spider silk. Right? That's not from a spider, but the same, same chemicals. Right? And here's 3D printing from ETH Zurich. Right? You can see here they printed a building using 3D printing that is basically CO2 neutral. So the, the BBC News said that roughly it's about 12% right? agriculture, and beyond that is about uh, the same than airplane fuel, what, car, what, what concrete creates. Right now, we have around the world 40,000 kilos of concrete for every person alive. Can you imagine that? 40,000 kilos for every person. And we can't recycle it. That's a bit of a problem. Right? So this would solve it. So if you're in construction, this is what's coming. Here's a 3D printed house. I know it looks ugly, right? But it's a house, right? This is Austin, Texas. This house costs $18,000 to print, and they do it in 26 hours. And it's too expensive right now. But imagine like this, you know, 5G internet used to be what we paid something like, I don't know, $5 a megabyte, remember that? For the internet on the phone? And now it's $5 for anything. It'll be the same for 3D printing. So that future is coming. 
right? The future of virtual reality, the digital twin, where we look at engines and we see them reflected, that's already in factories made by Siemens and so on, and this kind of holographic performance, right? Machine maintenance, reduce the cost by 70%. Now, once we know, of course, this is right now a demo, right? And so one thing is clear, the next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. And I'm not joking when I say this, right? This last 100 years, World War I and II, the nuclear bomb, the internet, all of that, the next 10 years, 3D printing, quantum computing, nuclear fusion, right? uh, economic change to sustainable energy, if you're in the if you in industry, you have to think about that. The next 10 years are not far away, right? They're basically much closer than ever before. And like I said earlier, many people are worried. Right? I mean, all we see today is bad news about the environment, bad news about Russia, <laughs> bad news about, you know, whatever. Right? The economy in the US, inflation. And the numbers are pretty astounding, right? The natural disasters, I mean, we, we saw it here with the hurricane, 30 times as much already. The next numbers show how expensive food has become around the world. A lot of people are now starving because food, you know, wheat and corn has become expensive because of all the climate change scenarios. And this list, I'm going to blow it up a little bit, okay? World Economic Forum, the risks that have worsened since the COVID crisis is 85 pieces <laughs> on that list. <laughs> it's like social cohesion, livelihood crisis, right? So if you were to read that, you would reach for the tequila glass quickly and say, I don't, I don't think I can think about the future, right? Doesn't sound that good. But here's the good news. As my colleague Kevin Kelly says, we should be optimistic not because we have less problems, we have a lot of problems, right? but we have a lot of power to deal with them. Capability, right? technology, science. The other thing that we're missing capability is collaboration. Right? And that is the thing that technology will not fix. But we have all the tools. People are saying that if we spend 2 to 3% of global GDP, we can solve climate change. We can go back in 2040 and actually make the world better again. We have all the tools, we just have to spend the money. Just, right? Big topic. Look at the stats here. All the innovations in the last 10 years, robotics, genome sequencing, energy storage. I mean, the change is coming. Trillion dollar new innovation platforms. I mean, this is a gold mine for Mexico. This is your own business you can do here if you get away from natural resources. Right? This is about technology. It's not about natural resources. Natural resources are always going to be there, but we know what the issues are. Blockchain, genome sequencing, energy storage. That's the future. It's too late for Mexico to become the leader in technology, but maybe Mexico can become a leader in climate change, and in climate technology. I mean, this is what's happening all around the world. Technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. But basically, everybody can afford technology sooner or later, except for the iPhone, of course, right? The iPhone keeps getting more expensive, you know? It's a stroke of genius. Right? So, we're now living in this world. Every old business is going, I would call it jokingly, the digital transformer, right? So. You end up with farming, smart farming, smart agriculture, smart energy, smart city, smart homes, smart transport, and maybe even smart government. Can you imagine that? Just kidding. Yeah. Of course that will happen. It's already happening in Mexico. I'm quite, aw I'm quite aware of this. Uh, but think about this for a second. Right? When everything becomes smart, what happens? The price goes down, hopefully. Access goes up. If we allow poorer people also to have access, of course, then we have to bring them in. Right? Industry flourishes. But we shouldn't overdo this. Connected everything, smart everything, sustainable everything, that's good. But it shouldn't take the place of being human. Right? For example, we could argue that we're going to connect everything like this, 
in a smart city. But we don't want everybody to know what everybody else does. You know, tracking, privacy, that's a very big concern, like we do on Facebook, right? Big problem. So we need security, safety, privacy, right? That is the counterbalance to the amazing technology. We cannot have technology solve problems but create 50 other ones that would be bigger than the original problem. Right? That's why I don't trust companies like Facebook. And they make $150 million profits per day. Do you know how much the entire oil and gas industry makes profit per day? Take a wild guess, eh? $2 billion. That's the entire oil and gas industry. And Facebook makes $150 million, like a little bit more than 10%. And there's no supervision, no rules. Right? So, the challenge is this, really, right? In this world, there's great technology, there's good technology, bad technology, but technology has no ethics. Technology doesn't care about your emotions, your feelings, your love, your whatever you... Th technology doesn't know that, right? It has no morals. So if technology makes it more efficient to lie or to manipulate, it will do that. So this is why with technology we have to have regulation and social contracts and balancing. Nobody likes regulation, right? But imagine if we lived in a world where everything was unregulated that was powerful. Oil, gas, banking, telecom. Telecom is regulated, banking is regulated, media is regulated, the internet. So that is, a, for example, this is the number one problem in America, right? That's because of what's happening with social media and the internet. We have this polarization, distorting democracy. So I want to introduce you to the main theme of, of the speech here. That's my three revolutions. This is most important for you guys uh, when you think about the future, okay? Starting with the industrial agriculture revolution, now we have three more. The digital revolution, you're aware of that. The sustainability revolution. And the human revolution. Okay? This is very important because they're all happening at the same time now. Consider yourself lucky. The digital revolution is still very much playing out here, or pretty much around the world. Everything that can go digital will go digital. The sustainability revolution basically means now it's climate emergency. We see that every year it's getting much worse, much quicker. And no matter what, whether we, what we like to believe in terms of how far it is away, it's happening quicker. So this is kind of creating the pressure to rethink everything. Look what happened in America, right? Build Back Better from Joe Biden didn't make it. But two weeks later, $580 billion for the new bill to put money into sustainable energy and, of course, chips and all of these things, right? technology. Right? So this is the key that's happening here. And with those things, we have to keep in mind the human revolution means that all of a sudden we're thinking, you know what, humans are also important. Right? It's a big reminder. Culture. Right? What is the biggest success factor in a country, in a company, or in your life? It is not technology. It's culture. Culture eats technology for breakfast. Can you collaborate? Can you work together? Can you innovate? Can you change? And I can tell you, I come from a culture, Germany, where this kind of thing is hard. Because, right? you know, we're not, it's, it's hard for us to make all these changes that quickly. So what I call the good future is dependent on working together on this human revolution. So here's the res recipe for your future, three things. Digitization, technology, I'll talk more about that. Decarbonization. I can tell you right now, if you're not going sustainable by 2030, you will not be at this event in 2031. Because your clients will hate you, your consumers will hate you. The government will probably hate you as well. Because that's where everything is going. We're going out of the fossil economy to the green, sustainable economy. And yes, we'll always have oil and gas in some way, right? But we're not going to increase it. Right? So we're going to a future that is very, very clearly in front of us right now. One point here, digital healthcare. 
In the COVID crisis, we used devices to connect with the doctor. And now this is the new normal. Now Apple is coming out with a device where I can have my body checked and send it to the doctor. And the doctor can say, hey, you should come in, there's a problem. That's trillions of dollars right there. Here on the reformation, the change of how we do things, right, is all the things that are happening that we have to address. I call that reformation because it's a change of mind. No, it's not technological. Decarbonization, energy, protein, food, transportation, and investing. Did you know that many companies around the world are now investing, meat companies, food companies, in food that's made in the lab? You can grow meat, now it sounds crazy, right? You can grow meat in the lab, and you can eat it. So, just to show you some examples on this without uh, you know, getting you too scared on this, but I have a film on this later. But really what's happening here now, it's a realization that this curve, climate technology, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more, right? that's the gold mine right there. All of these things are happening right now. Precision agriculture, battery recycling, the smart grid, climate fintech. So here's the bottom line. Green is the new digital. You want to be a leader? It's green and digital. So this is very hard to understand when you're looking at just, I think there's just now a new refinery that's starting in Mexico, right? Uh, for the future, right? We have to think about what we're doing here. Can we do both at the same time? I mean, Larry Fink, who runs the biggest investment capital firm in the world, he says the next 100 unicorns, billion dollar companies, will be in climate technology. I mean, think about the opportunity here, right? What's happening, mind boggling. So, looking at Mexico, we have to get away from this idea of the future being about extraction. Extraction of natural resources, extraction of people, another thing, right? We're switching to creation. Inventing things, doing new things, collaborating, figuring out a new way into the future. Do you really think in 10 years we're going to live the same way that we do today, fly the same way, eat the same way? We already know that's unsustainable. We've got to think about our kids here too. Right? Creation economy is what's happening, that's where we are going. And in this world, it's all about this huge shift to ecosystems. And guess what? The money is larger than before, but it's in different places. Right? So it's not that we can't make money, it's not that we can't grow, of course we have to grow, right? but grow in different places. Right? So that means we're moving from the ego economy, that's here in transportation, oil, gas, cars, traditional shipping, to ecosystems, right? connected systems that work with technology to reinvent how we do things. Now you're thinking, well, that's going to take a long time in Mexico, right? To bring that change about. It will not. If you look at other countries that are not totally developed yet, right? they're leaping. Look at India. It's hard to compare Mexico with India, right? But people are leaping into this. A whole new bill in India that talks about new ecosystems of money, for example. I'll show you some examples. Investing is changed. If you want to attract, attract money from foreign investors, ESG money, environmental, sustainable, governmental investment, you have to change the agenda. A new kind of investing. That's where the money is. That's where all the money is, all the funds are divesting now from the oil and gas industry. In America, the IRA, not the Irish people, the Inflation Reduction Act, right? They're pivoting America. It's always hard to say what is next in America, clearly. Right? But we're seeing this is a gigantic pivot all of a sudden. It's flipping the whole story around. And why are they doing this? They know the future is green and sustainable technology that works. So here, quite clearly, we have to think of another thing. And that is millennials. Gen Y, 
you know, people between, say, 25 and 40, okay? Because they don't care anymore about the old promise that everything works just fine. I'd, I've noticed if you talk to your kids, right, they are juggling all of these problems, especially with COVID, and this is what they want, right? They want to think further away from just a simple profit and growth to four things, people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. So this is starting to happen in companies, Unilever, Patagonia, many other companies, even Shell Oil, right, is shifting to a sustainable strategy like this. So I also want to encourage you to think about things that you, used to, that you used to think of are unthinkable. When I was in the music business, I went to talk to the record labels, Universal, EMI, Sony, about the future of music, right? And I said, you know, the music will be in the cloud up there, and I will have a, what we called a universal music device. It was a joke, right? And they said, that's ridiculous, because if that happens, we won't make any money, it'll be free. And sure enough, it was free for a while, and the record labels lost 70% of, of their profit. And now, guess how many people are paying for music on the internet? You guys are probably paying, Spotify or Apple, right? 185 million people are paying almost $10 a month, right? That's two billion a month, new money. Right? So we have to think about what we think of unthinkable and where that's going. I'll start here. Right. Hello. Okay, you can continue now. There we go. Unthinkable. With the climate change emergency, we're going to see things that were unthinkable before. It may take longer in Mexico for that to happen, but this is going to happen in Europe very quickly. Carbon tax. Every flight you take, mandatory carbon tax. That's, that proposal has been around for, and it sounds crazy, right? But what it does, it raises trillions of dollars to reinvest into the new economy. Look at this chart. We are on this chart, the blue box, the red box, and the blue box. Higher income, upper middle income. We cause most of the pollution in flying. It's not the poor people that do that, right? We do all the flying. I'm, I'm the worst, of course, right? I offset every single flight already. And you can expect legislation that says you have to do that for every flight mandatory. We may even see a carbon tax on eating meat. Now that sounds crazy, right? Why would we do that? Because we can fund other things with it. Right? So think about this. What is currently unthinkable becomes the new normal. And we learned that in the COVID crisis, right? Things that change because they have to. The valleys of Mexico fill, filled with solar stations? You have enough room for this. It's not very pretty. Right? You don't put this in Cozumel. Right? You put it somewhere where you can harvest energy. And this is becoming the new normal. High rises for growing farms and vegetables, grown by robots. That's already happening in the Middle East, in really hot places. Basically, you can do this kind of what's called vertical farming right? by having robots grow organic vegetables. I know it sounds crazy when you think about it, right? True science fiction, but it's already happening. In the pharma business, are we going to take pills? I don't know about you. Are you taking pills about you know, cholesterol like statins and, and blood pressure and so on, right? We're not going to take pills like this in 2030. Guess not, because we're going to have technology that tells us what's happening. So we can prevent to get sick. That will not stop diseases, of course, but it will help prevent a lot of them. Whole different ball game coming our way. We're going to work in virtual places. This is Facebook, Oculus Rift, the, the Horizon workstation. Many of you are already kind of doing this, right? Right, it's fancy, right? I, I'm not too much of a friend of that, actually, because I think we do need humans around us rather than holograms, but, you know, this is happening. Money is going digital. I think in the next two or three years, we're going to see a central bank digital currency in Mexico. We already see it in all these countries, including the Bahamas. Right? 
where you can pay with digital money. I'm not talking about Bitcoin here. I'm talking about a fiat money, a real money backed up by the state bank that is 100% digital. Imagine what that will do for payments right? and also, of course, for corruption, right? <laughs> being able to track everything. 3D printing, shoes, hearts, kneecaps, airplane parts, robots. I would love to play the soundtrack of Mick Jagger dancing with a robot, or rather the robot dancing with Mick Jagger. But if I do that, then I get barred on YouTube later, so I can't do that. But now we have robots that can do unspeakable things. Any robot that would have tried this would have killed everybody in the band 10 years ago. And now we have robots that do this, right, in factories. Of course, you know that's the reality. And now we have Elon Musk launching a humanoid robot just four days ago that can act kind of, well, I wouldn't say like a human, but, you know, do human tasks. Think about that for a second. He says that robot is going to be $20,000 and be able to do all kinds of homework, you know, housework and cleaning and the mind boggles with imagination. So let's go back to this. One learning from tonight. Go get some ears. You can't buy them on Amazon. You have to develop them. Pay attention. I can't tell you the number one thing is not that people are stupid or don't know things. They just don't pay attention. It's right here for us to see. Question on our assumptions. So what's going to happen with humans and machines? Where are we going with this? Well, clearly, this is what's happening, right? This device is my external brain. And if this device goes on here, I become kind of superhuman. I can see all, all of your LinkedIn profiles. And I can see what you're thinking later, you know, eventually, I guess. And yes, you know, we've had industry 4.0, industry 3.0, and now we have industry 5.0, intelligent industry, right? AI. This is, of course, the holy grail if we can make machines somewhat understanding of what we're trying to do. Not intelligent like humans, but not stupid as before. So this robot, for example, right, shows human-like emotions. It's programmed to reflect what humans think and how they work and could be used in hospitals and things like that. So if we define artificial intelligence, uh, the founder of DeepMind said, computer systems that turn information and data into knowledge. That, that is AI. That should scare us, right? Isn't that what we have, knowledge? I mean, look at this. Dolly 2 is a system from OpenAI that can take text like a koala dunking a basketball and turn it into an image that never existed before. It can also create new variations of pre-existing images. Through deep learning, Dolly understands the relationship between text and images. So here's a software where you type in a command and say, a penguin that uses an iPhone in Cozumel, and it makes a picture. And now the cover of Cosmopolitan magazine last month was made by a machine in 12 seconds. The machine wasn't paid, by the way. Right? So these things are happening all around us. This picture was drawn by an artificial intelligence mach machine and won an art prize four weeks ago. Right? It was a drawing of a, of a scene in the mid-ages. And what we see here really clearly is the, the definition of artificial intelligence. Knowledge without wisdom is useless. In other words, those machines can do all these things, but they don't really understand what it is. You know, this is what makes us human, of course. It's what we understand where we are going with this. So we're going to go into this world, clearly, in the next decade everywhere. But here's the good news. On this pyramid, the robots can cover the lower part. Right? Data, information, maybe a little bit of knowledge. But the upper part, the deep knowledge, the understanding, the wisdom, the consciousness, very hard to do for a machine. This is why we will not have total unemployment, because we have machines. 
You know how difficult it is to automate, for example, driving? Waymo does it, but generally speaking, we don't see self-driving cars in many places. It's very hard to do. So this is machine turf. This will be our turf. And this is what we have to learn. This is what we have to teach our kids. We have to teach our kids to have understanding, deeper knowledge, wisdom, purpose, humanity. Okay? And this is where we're going to keep our jobs. If you work like a robot, a robot will take your job. Right? Remember that. And if you learn like a robot at school, you'll end up working for the robot. Right? Because they will get smart enough very quickly. Right? So important for us to realize where this is going and uh, what the next step is in order to protect our humanity. So some final thoughts, and then we have a short debate. First, when we look at our future, this is what's happening, right? We are surrounded by technology. I call this the Neoluvian man. You heard about the, uh, uh, the other famous Leonardo da Vinci man. Now, this one is basically connected with our future, which means that as we go into that future, we have to emphasize the things that aren't about technology. Emotions, intuition, compassion. Why are we here? Right? If it was just the exchange of information, we could do it through the screen on a Zoom call. Right? We're here to connect, <laughs> to find something, right? to have empathy, consciousness, values. This is so important when we think about the future of industry. We can automate everything, but not what makes us human. Here's our ticket for the future. Awesome humans on top of amazing technology. So this is what we have to learn, what we have to teach our kids, and what we have to do with our products as well. And here's another kind of painful thing to realize. In many ways, we have a world, a world around us that is essentially broken televisions. You know, things that used to work but don't really work anymore. We have to realize the future is not an extension of the past. Your kids don't buy CDs. The kids of their kids will not drive a car. And many of, of their kids will end up eating the meat from the laboratory or from the organic high-rise. Okay? The future is not the same than the present. It's different. It's not just a, a better version of the present. So therefore, the end of oil and gas, that's not a big deal for us if we can find the next iteration of what it used to be. This is our natural evolution. And go back to what I said earlier, our destination is this, digitization, decarbonization, and reformation of our economic logic. That is, of course, the hardest part. So, brace for this. We're going into a world of perma-change. Right? Okay, perma-change means when, whenever you think something is steady, it's going to change again. Right? That is because the next 10 years have all these things happening at the same time. And what we have to do with that, we have to help each other go through that right? and also conserve energy. Right? For example, I have recently stopped watching too much news. Because I like news with my work, right? But when I watch too much of it, I feel my energy draining because all the news is so, you know, so much ballast there, right? And also, I would recommend do something that I do a lot, is I do one day every two weeks that is media-free. No phone, no television, no internet. Media-free day, right? Remember, offline is the new luxury, right? That's where we're going with this. So I'm going to print this out. I'm going to send you the PDF so you can look at this. But the paradigm shifts are mind-boggling. Right? The mega challenge isn't the economy anymore. It's climate. The mega shift is from carbon to clean, transportation to electric, that whole list. I'll put it up on, the, on Twitter later so you can download the list. a bit hard to read from the back. And also our time is up. So lastly, don't wait and see. Wait and see means waiting to die. Because by the time you get to the end of this curve of development, you're already behind in putting resources in. We're moving to the creative economy. We're moving to a world that is green as a digital. And we're moving to a world of ecosystems. My clicker is not very happy tonight, but will eventually appear. So a world where everything is connected. That's where we're going. That's our future. And as I said in the beginning, 
The doors aren't closing because we have all these problems. They are opening. That's hard to understand because we kind of feel like the door is closing with wars and famine and food prices and pandemics, right? But they're leading to conclusions of change. We're going to change a hundred-year-old economy of fossil fuel into a renewable economy. And we're going to make more money with that than with a fossil fuel economy. And we're going to have a better place, right? So going back to what I said in the beginning, the future is better than you think. And I think you have to believe in that when you're in the, in, the, in the business of manufacturing, industry, and so on, what the future holds and where things are going. One other point as to the title of the event, right? Inclusion. This is the key to creativity. Diversity, inclusion, hyper-collaboration. Not hyper-competition. Bring in the young people, the minorities, and the women. You can see in the times of COVID, the countries that were led by women did about 30% better in solving the problem, just as a side note. So, as we go in this direction, of course, all about collaboration and where things are going. And the film I made, The Good Future, you can watch it at thegoodfuturefilm.com, is based on one principle by the famous futurist Buckminster Fuller, who says, we are to be architects of the future, not victims. The future doesn't fall down on us. It's not made in America. It's not made in China. We make our own future. We make our own decision and our own path. And I think that's important to realize as we're working to create new concepts and new ideas. So, muchas gracias for your time and attention. Check out my book. If you have a minute, it's available in Spanish. Thank you. Agradecemos a nuestro conferencista y a continuación daremos inicio con la mesa de diálogo. Solo les pedimos unos minutos en lo que nuestro personal de apoyo sube los sillones al escenario. De diálogo de la conferencia magistral, cedo la palabra a la moderadora Alejandra Gutiérrez. Muy bien. ¿Cómo están? Buenos, buenas tardes. De verdad ha sido un gusto escucharlo. Creo que muchos de nosotros estuvimos oyendo comentarios a, hacia los lados y quedaron muy contentos de la plática y nos hizo clic con varias de, de las cosas que están sucediendo en nuestro país y en el mundo y lo que nosotros podríamos estar haciendo cada uno desde nuestras trincheras. Y me encantaría preguntarte sobre todo lo que dijiste, sobre todo la parte de considerar a, a la revolución humana que creo que es fundamental, y hoy hablando de la sustentabilidad, que no está peleada con el desarrollo económico, y hubo una frase que nos moviste tanto al gobernador como a tu servidora, que luego es muy difícil o creer o soñar que en los gobiernos puede darse también este tipo de tres revoluciones. Desde tu visión, ¿tú qué, qué verías a futuro, para crear ese futuro que todos queremos, que puede participar un municipio desde lo local o un gobierno desde lo local para que realmente se transforme hacia el interior y ayude a transformar a, a la ciudad que le, que le toca poner las reglas o coadyuvar. Sí, es una buena pregunta. You know, it is the role of government to uh, negotiate between business and science and technology to create a, a good ecosystem, right? So, uh, regulation understanding contracts, working together, and bringing everybody on the same table. Right? Because a future that is just based on technology would not be a very human future. Right? Uh, we need a future that is based also on what people need, which is engagements, relationships, experiences, not just what business needs. Right? So I think the role of government is very important here. We're moving into a future that is where government has the balancing role to make it all work. Right? The role of business is to make money. Right? So we, when we think the, of the stock market as a different vehicle, not just making money, but also making purpose, making people and planet, like I said earlier, then we're talking about a whole different thing. So ultimately, this will not happen without government asking for it. Right? And I'm not talking about more regulation. I'm talking about an ecosystem that creates benefit for everybody. And that's where government comes in. Muchísimas gracias, muy interesante. Y nos gustaría oír tu opinión, Pepe, desde la visión industrial sobre la conferencia que se acaba de dar y qué opinas o qué eh, preguntarías al respecto. 
Gracias. Gracias, Arle. La verdad, felicidades, Gerard. Excelente presentación. Yo creo que nos dejaste a todos muy, muy motivados eh, por esta nueva revolución. Ya estamos apenas pensando en el 4 y tú ya vas en el 5, ¿no? Entonces, tenemos que acelerar el paso en un país en donde a veces parece que el tema verde no va con nosotros. Entonces, el futuro es cerca de la digitaliz digitalización y el cuidado del medio ambiente, todos nos sentimos inspirados después de haber escuchado tu, tu brillante exposición. ¿Cuáles son los tres pasos iniciales que una micro y pequeña empresa debe de tomar para avanzar en este sentido? ¿Cómo inspirar y mover tu equipo para aprovechar la coyuntura y el futuro? Esa sería mi pregunta, Gerard. Gracias. Yes, well, I think the first thing to realize for any company is that business as usual is either dead or dying. Right? So if you're lucky, you still have a business as it was 10 years ago, but you will not have that in 10 years. And you have to start looking for the next window. For example, picture the people who make clutches, you know, for the car. Okay, in Germany, right? They're, we're talking about 30,000 people here, right, who make parts of engines. What's going to happen to them when we have electric engines? I don't know. Right? So if they don't think 10 years ahead, they keep working on the better clutch, and one day somebody says, contract over. Right? So if you have a small, medium-sized company, you have to look at the next window. You know, what is the next product? What is the next innovation? Can you pivot? Right? Like, for example, many, many companies make small pieces of engines or, you know, we have to look at what is the next iteration. Can we get into the software business? Right? Like, every company has to go more like this and think about new possibilities. And the biggest problem there is that we, if we have been successful, we think that the future is the same but faster. Right? Because, but it's not. Right? If we are successful, the chances are very high they will be totally the opposite. So we have to start thinking and looking at the future. I always say to every company, you should spend 10% of your time in the future. And I'm not talking about watching movies or Netflix. Or, right? I'm talking about reading, talking, going to events, developing the ears. Right? When you are future-proof, that's your success, whether it's a company or a country. Right? A country that's future-proof, want to get a good example? apart, of course, from Switzerland, is New Zealand. A country that always looks at the next iteration, that right? takes a wider view. Right? So I think this is just a question of the mindset. Right? And the one thing about Americans, for example, is Americans have a future mindset. They're always thinking about the next big thing, right? making a big mess sometimes, but generally, looking at the future, right? We have to learn from that and we have to say, we work today, we think tomorrow, at the same time. Muchas gracias. Eh, creo que es muy interesante y lo que oímos en tu plática también respecto a que los cambios ahora son mucho más acelerados y creo que lo vemos. O sea, a, hace unos años ca, para poder ir avanzando, pues pasaban décadas. Hoy vemos que de una semana a otra las cosas han cambiado y efectivamente tenemos que construir el futuro, pero no es el futuro que caiga. Tiene, tenemos que aprender a construir, como lo comentabas, como arquitectos, el futuro que todos queremos. He oído en varias ocasiones comentar justamente el mismo ejemplo que tú comentas de, de los coches eléctricos, he escuchado al gobernador y creo que como gobierno del Estado es muy importante por las políticas que generan, por las acciones que se deben de tomar, no puedes estar resolviendo solamente los problemas de hoy, sino que tienes que estar ahora sí que con ese 10% y en una de esas hasta más, construyendo el futuro que queremos para el Estado, justamente eh, con las herramientas necesarias. Gobernador, no sé qué opina al respecto o le eh, quiera preguntar. Sí, claro. Bueno, felicidades antes que nada por la, la excelente presentación. Eh, me llama mucho la atención esto del 10% ¿no? de innovación, de pensar en el futuro en, los, en las empresas y hablaban del caso de Nueva Zelanda. Nosotros creo que estamos en Guanajuato, me hace 
sentido la presentación con lo que estamos planteando en Guanajuato, de pensar en la industria 4.0, en la mentefactura, en la innovación, crear un instituto de innovación como lo hicimos con un fondo de apoyo a los innovadores de 100 millones de pesos, crear eventos como el Foro Go para e-commerce, para el, el Startup Capital, para los emprendedores, va en ese sentido. Pero me llamó mucho la atención el tema de las energías renovables. Si pudiéramos ponerle un número como ese 10% de pensar en el futuro, ¿qué porcentaje debemos dedicarle los estados y las empresas a las energías renovables y qué tan en riesgo están con la nueva dinámica que se da en Europa por Rusia y, U y Ucrania? Es decir, eh, después de ese anuncio del G7 de apostar al 2030 a vehículos eléctricos, energías renovables, hay un frenón, hay un retroceso, dado esta guerra con Rusia y la falta de energía, porque viene un, un invierno duro para Europa y estarán, como decíamos hace rato, ¿no? dispuestos a quemar combustóleo nuevamente para tener calefacción o la apuesta por las energías renovables hoy es suficiente. Son varias preguntas en una, una disculpa por tan extender, extenderme tanto. Sí, yes, gracias. Some very easy questions. Um, so, basically, the general number that I use for investing into the green future is two to three percent of GDP. Okay, uh, that is the number, like the military, same general number. If we spend that on the green future, we can create a whole new economy out of this. The World Economic Forum said there's going to be almost a hundred million new jobs in the green economy. Right? from people who write programs, people who deliver things, people who monitor things, people who, who do uh, activities there, and that is a fantastic opportunity. So the current crisis in, in Ukraine, Russia, is kind of like a trigger to rethink our strategy. Right? The dependence that Germany had, for example, on Russian gas is a major problem that was neglected for the last 30 years. Right? So there are things that we have to look at that are painful, And yes, we will not have enough energy if it wasn't for traditional fuel right now. But the argument to make is that, you know, we have to take this opportunity to say, next generation nuclear, right? That is, I, I'm not fond of nuclear, but it is one of those things, right? Nuclear fusion, which is a major investment now. Uh, solar, bioenergy, biothermal energy, and all of the, all of the things together can create a net zero environment by 2030. Right? Um, and that will mean that we can create a whole bunch of new jobs, new industries, new everything around everything that we do. And this is a decision that we make. It's not uh, something that is sort of a, 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 an optional thing. You know, five years ago, you would sit around and say, uh, sustainability, we talk about that after dinner. Yeah? So Bertolt Brecht once said, Dinner first, then morals, right? It's no longer about morals, or about any of this, it's existential, right? And Mexico is in one of the worst places for the climate crisis, the heating up of heat waves and droughts and floods. Right? So my view on that is that any money spent on going green and sustainable and circular is good money spent. In the meantime, there's compromises that we have to make, which can also be painful, but that's really different for each country. So in Europe, we made a solid decision to go 100% net zero and sustainable, which I think is definitely a good course. Muchísimas gracias. Algo importante eh, que creo que se, también se ha tocado es que sí tenemos que apostarle eh, en todo momento a la sustentabilidad pensando en la persona, pero Creo que se, me, me gustaría escuchar de tu parte qué mensaje les darías, no solamente a quienes somos funcionarios de gobierno, sino también, sobre todo, a, a los industriales que el día de hoy están aquí, para que se pueda comprender que se puede seguir teniendo ganancias, se puede seguir cuidando a la persona, al ser humano que trabaja en cada una de las empresas, pero que también se puede estar cumpliendo con estas reglas que tú comentas. Yes, it's, it's important to understand that we're not talking about a degrowth, you know, a, a no-growth future. There's no such thing, okay? People have children, people invent, people do things, right? We, we drive places, we want to meet, we want to fly, right? Degrowth, in my view, is not a good argument. But unlimited growth is killing us, right? Unlimited growth, right? Would basically 30 years game over, right? That's kind of the estimate. Right? 
So it has to be sustainable growth, circular growth, giving back growth, right? creating equality and all of those things. That is the ultimate argument. Right? Um, and I think we're sitting here today looking at this and saying, you know, uh, we still have time. We have 10 years. We have 10 years to make this work. And climate change is going to hurt for 10 or 20 years, but we can solve it. It's not, we're not at the end of this yet, right? So the good news is it's urgent, but it's not over, you know? Um, that's what gives me hope. And as I said in my speech, the great thing is we have all the science and technology. The things that we're inventing every week, you would not believe, right? Nanotechnology to go into my blood to filter the cholesterol like little robots, right? Uh, Life-enhancing technology that makes us live longer. Every week, there's a new invention. We just need to put it into the right policy, right? And organize our system so that it can come to fruition. Muchas gracias. Nos queda claro que no es tener tecnología, digitalización, innovación por tenerla, sino que tenemos que tener muy claro para qué y por qué se tiene que hacer estos cambios, sobre todo utilizando todos los mecanismos que hoy tenemos. No sé si, usted, si quieren hacer alguna otra pregunta o comentario o del público. Sí, Roberto. Este, muy buena presentación, muchas gracias. Así como la tecnología nos hace más fácil la vida, hay mucho este, debate respecto a la tecnología que también está afectando a la humanidad, porque perdemos costumbres, este, dejamos de hacer cosas, nos confiamos más y sobre todo para las nuevas generaciones. ¿Qué opinas al respecto? Gracias. Well, I I always like to say that too much of a good thing is a very bad thing, right? Too much food will kill you, too much tequila will kill you, too much smoking will definitely kill you. But we don't make tequila illegal or smoking, or somewhat, I would say, right? But basically, technology is the same way. When we use technology for its purpose, it's a tool. When we use it too much, it's a torture, right? Technology is a fantastic tool, but a terrible ruler. So if we allow technology, for example, to tell us what to do in the sense of, for example, artificial intelligence telling us who is a good person and who can be in jail, who, in, you know, like in China, the supervision of everything, then we end up in a place where technology is the dictator. Right? But on the other hand, we want to use technology to make things better, so this will be about compromises. Like, for example, we're going to need a global a council of artificial intelligence. And I think, I, I keep saying this to government, I think every government needs to have a minister of the future. Maybe something for your state, right? A person whose job it is to bring the future only that. In Dubai, they have 30 ministers, right? They have a minister of AI, they have a minister of the future, and get this, they have a minister of happiness. It's a woman, of course, right? not to say anything about that, but anyway, think about this, right? Having somebody that actually is dedicated to the future, right? because the thing about the future is we think about the future as tomorrow. The future isn't tomorrow. The future is here. We just haven't noticed. Right? We just haven't paid attention. And if we keep doing this, then basically we'll keep going, and one day the future just kind of washes over us. And this is important to understand because right now we're in the 10 year window of getting it right. Muchísimas gracias. Creo que fue una plática muy enriquecedora para todos nosotros. Agradecemos el tiempo que te tomaste y sobre todo por contestar las dudas que tenemos. De verdad que muchísimas felicidades eh, y a nombre de todos. Ah, una última pregunta, perdón. <laughs> Perdón, una pregunta muy rápida, había levantado la mano hace rato. Hace rato mencionabas el tema de, de, de la movilidad, del viajar, del flying, de volar. Eh, ¿qué, ¿Qué es lo que ves exactamente? Porque no me quedó claro. ¿Va a, ver, ¿Va a ser más por el lado del taxing, más por el lado de la restricción? Digo, del taxing o de la restricción, de restringir la frecuencia con la que se vuela, con la, de restringir la movilidad y, y, el, y la posibilidad de viajar cuando uno quiera, de trabajo o personal. 
Yes, I mean, traveling and meeting and going places is a human thing. It's like food, right? Basically, we're not going to stop traveling. We're not going to stop going places because that's what we are, right? So that's good news. The other news is airplane travel has become very cheap sometimes, and we're not paying what it actually costs, right? So the side effect of travel, 12.8% of global pollution comes from travel, tourism, and hospitality. 3% from flying. 3% of global pollution is from flying. But we have solutions, right? Sustainable airplane fuel, hydrogen, trains. Like in Europe, we're, we're going on the train now. The train is 100th as much of CO2 than the airplane. And, and so there are solutions. We're going to keep traveling. What's going to happen? I'm very sure about this. I don't know about Mexico, but in general, we're going to see mandatory tax for each flight. So you will pay a tax when you buy a ticket. It may be as high as the ticket itself, depending on your income. Right? It's going to hurt me a lot. Right? Not because of the income, but because of the flying, right? Yeah. So, but I am volunteering. Right? Say, I'd be happy, and I do that now. I pay, I pay a tax. On, on. Because when we pay the tax, we can raise hundreds of mil billions of dollars to solve all the problems around it. Making airplanes more efficient, for example, can save 50% of CO2. Right? Replacing airplanes like Leon from Leon to Mexico City, come on, now we can take a train, right? A nice train. Right? That would be better, right? So these kind of things are happening. And I think really what we're looking at is multimodal transportation. And airplanes are going to adapt to this. So there's already the first planes that you can look at for hydrogen in small cities with a reach of 50 kilometers that you can take that are also automated. It's already here. Right? Yeah. So innovation is happening. But the thing about innovation is it does not happen without pain. Right? When we have pain and people are saying, you can't do this anymore, then we start. Right? So take the pain away and uh, start before it happens. Muchísimas gracias. Muy interesante la, la respuesta. Y yo les pediría un aplauso porque creo que todos Thank aprendimos you. mucho el día de hoy. Muchas, muchas gracias.